Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me now is Dr. Jonathan McClatchy. How are you doing, Jonathan? I'm doing very well. Thanks so much for having me on. How are you doing, David? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Um, now, you have sort of an interesting background. Uh, why don't you share a little bit about... Uh, I know you 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 have a doctor in front of your name, so why don't you go ahead and share a little bit about that? Sure. So just to give a rundown of a little of my educational background, uh, I did my bachelor's degree um, at University of Strathclyde in forensic biology, which is the application of scientific evidence to crime scene investigation. So did that for four years, and then I um, fell in love with the world of molecular biology, and uh, was really struck in particular by the engineering prowess and designoid characteristics of living organisms, was often rather baffled at how anyone could go through a four-year university program in the natural sciences and come out an atheist at the other end, because the evidence seemed to me to be so uh, compelling for the truth of theism. So I um, subsequently, following my bachelor's degree, did a master's degree in evolutionary biology to try to gain a, a better understanding of uh, the evolutionary perspective. Um, and then I uh, interned for a year at the Discovery Institute in Seattle, Washington, uh, helping Stephen Meyer with his book, uh, Darwin's Doubt. Um, and then I did a subsequent master's degree in medical and molecular bioscience, and then which was at Newcastle University. And then finally, I did a PhD uh, studying the uh, evolution of the eukaryotic cell cycle, the cell division cycle, which was also the university and the professor of biology at a Christian school called Sattler College in Boston, Massachusetts. So I teach various uh, biology related courses, including um, uh, uh, freshman biology, genetics and genomics, microbiology. Um, I teach bioethics. So um, that's just a little bit of my, my uh, educational background. I'm also currently pursuing a master's degree at Southern Evangelical Seminary, which is in biblical studies as well. So. Uh, uh, two quick follow-up questions based on some stuff you just said. Now, you, you said you're, you're baffled by how someone can go through, uh, you know, an education in the sciences and, and come out an atheist, uh, but you have a doctorate in evolutionary biology. So doesn't that explain how we got to where we are? Like, how can, how can you be thinking that... Uh, that there's no good atheistic explanation for this stuff when you've just been, you've got it, you've literally got a doctorate in the explanation. Yeah, so obviously I, I don't find the explanation particularly satisfying. I think that there are certain features of biological systems which are best explained um, by an intelligent cause rather than an unguided stochastic process such as um, chance and physical necessity. Um, in terms of evolution, there are a number of real scientific challenges, I think, to the naturalistic scenario of life's origins and evolution on Earth. Um, so, for example, I, I think that there is merit to Michael Behe's uh, concept of irreducible complexity, and I think that there are many thousands of such systems in biology. And uh, basically, an irreducible complex system is where you have a higher level objective that's accomplished by multiple subcomponents or multiple subfunctions that have to work together in concert to achieve that higher level objective. And so any process that's capable of producing that type of system is going to uh, have to uh, have foresight in order to visualize a complex end goal and bring together everything needed to, to realize that end goal. So an example of an irreducibly complex system would be uh, D the DNA replication machinery. Um, by which the cell will duplicate its DNA to prepare for um, cell division. And there are a number of components that are necessary for that to work. You've got the DNA polymerase that actually carries out the copying. You have the initiation proteins that open up the, um, uh, the DNA double helix or unwind the DNA double helix. You've got the helicase that breaks the hydrogen bonds um, that link the bases together to allow for copying. You have the single-stranded binding proteins that bind to the single strands of DNA and prevent them from reannealing. Uh, the DNA polymerase isn't able to begin copying unless it's first primed because it needs what's called a three-prime hydroxyl group in order to copy. So you have a primase enzyme which synthesizes the short primer and so forth. That's just a very um, short sketch of some of the components needed. Uh, the DNA polymerase also needs to have a be clamped onto the, the strand of DNA. It has a like a sliding clamp and the sliding clamp itself has to be loaded on by a clamp loader and so on. You have two isomerase enzymes that alleviate the supercoiling that's induced by the torsional stress and so on. If any of those components and many more were missing, then you wouldn't have DNA replication machinery that worked half as well as it used to or a quarter as well as it used to, but it would be broken. And um, this is one of my favorite examples of irreducible complexity because um, 
natural selection presupposes differential survival. You can't have natural selection unless you have differential survival, but differential survival requires that you have self-replicatability. Um, and so you can't really invoke natural selection to explain the origins or the emergence of self-replicatability without assuming the existence of the very thing you're trying to explain. So that's just one uh, small challenge to evolution. There's a lot more that one uh, could say on that. Yeah, I was, uh, I was just on a long car ride with uh... Rid Van, the apostate prophet, and uh, we ended up talking about that a little bit. And uh, I was just pointing out that in order for evolution to even get off the ground, what you need from the beginning, as far as something that would something that is capable of evolving. So right there from the beginning, whatever life forms, it has to be capable one of replicating itself so it's not just some sort of life that forms and then eventually dies and then there's nothing else it has to be capable of replicating itself uh, two um it can't make exact copies of itself because then you have no variation and there's there's nothing for you know there's no variation to act on uh but three it has to be very similar to the original in order to preserve any uh any uh, any good traits. And so you need something very specific in order to get the entire process off the ground. And uh, I don't know, seems pretty amazing that you get that right from the, right from the beginning. I mean, imagine like a factory or something like that, building a factory that makes, that replicates factories. And that's like the first factory and it's capable of replicating other factories or something. Uh, exactly. For molecular machines, like what I just described, uh, what you require are multiple proteins many different proteins that have to be very specifically crafted in order to work together to achieve this higher level objective. Um, and so the probabilities of getting even one protein are, in my judgment, astronomically small, but the probabilities just multiply exponentially when we're, need, when we're requiring multiple components to work together in, in concert to achieve a higher level objective. Even the simplest organisms like um, Mycoplasma genitalium, for example, which is um, a bacterial cell, which is um, it's an obligate um, parasite and it can't it's not free living it can't live outside of a outside of a host and it's one of the simplest known organisms and yet it still requires about 300 genes 300 different proteins so it's uh, the the complexity of even the simplest life is just absolutely mind-boggling and way beyond what can be plausibly accounted for by a stochastic unguided process that doesn't have a mind involved and so in summary the uh, the, when, when we observe these sorts of irreducible complex systems and information rich systems, information processing and retrieval apparatus that we find inside the cell, these sorts of things are phenomena which are habitually associated in every realm of experience with conscious deliberation or intelligent agency. And so it's not particularly surprising on the hypothesis that a mind was involved that you'd find information rich systems such that we find in biology, but it is wildly surprising on the falsehood of that hypothesis. And so it tends to, in fact, strongly confirm the design hypothesis over the non design hypothesis, which in turn lends credence to a theistic worldview. And uh, um, when you're when regular people when normal people uh, who, who don't have a science uh, background here protein, they're, they're, they're only thinking of in terms of nutrition, right? Like I need to get a certain amount of protein. There's a certain amount of protein in this food. I, if I'm working out, I need to get my protein. You're talking about, when you talk about proteins in living organisms, these are basically things that are the structures in living things that are that are doing all the work in terms of, uh, how, would you, how would you describe it in terms of these parts? They're like little, they're like little machines performing little functions, right? Right. So enzymes are comprised of subunits called amino acids. And basically, the sequential arrangement of those amino acids will determine how a protein will collapse into a three-dimensional structure. And that three-dimensional structure will determine how the protein behaves within the cell, whether it might it might contribute to some biochemical pathway or, or it might uh, contribute to some uh, larger molecular machine. Um, so that, that's, that is a function of proteins in biology. And when you talked about um, how improbable it is to get a protein. So amino acids arranged in a sequence, they have to be in a certain sequence in order for this to collapse into something that actually performs the relevant function. Um, it was in uh, Signature in the Cell, uh, Signature in the Cell. Um, Dr. Myers described the, uh, the probability of getting 
these proteins and I forget what it's called, but there's a, you can actually calculate the maximum possible number of outcome, I mean, of, uh, of particle interactions since the beginning of the universe by you take the entire number of seconds from the beginning of the universe and you multiply that by uh, the fastest uh, possible interactions between particles. So you set the speed of light as an upper limit. So assume that every particle is interacting at the speed of light. And then you multiply that times the number of particles in the universe. And it's around 10 to the 80th power. And you get this number. And there you have the entire possible maximum number of particle interactions since the beginning of the universe. And when you get that number and then you say, okay, here are here's the probability of getting a relevant medium length protein chain. And given the time available in the universe, you're not even close to getting one, one medium length protein. So the idea that you're getting the hundreds you would need for the, the most basic known life, all in the same place to where they can come together and form the cell, uh, seems astronomically improbable. I'm bringing this up because human beings seem pretty good with simple probabilities, right? Like if I flip a coin, one and two, we get one and two. If it's uh, rolling, you know, some dice, we get the we get the we get the idea of the probabilities of rolling dice. Once you start getting into like your probability of winning the lottery, it's like you know, let's say one in seventeen million or something like that. There, we're not get we're not very good at it, and that's why people keep playing. Um, but then when you're talking to you're talking about like one in ten to the ten to the this, it's just uh our minds aren't very good at processing these kinds of probabilities. And so we think, ah, but there's a long time in the universe and there's a lot of space in the universe. There's a lot of stars and therefore it could happen when actually mathematically you can calculate the probabilities, even given gigantic space and tons of particles and so on. And you're still not even close to getting what you need. Absolutely. You're completely correct. Uh, this is what Dembski calls universal probability bound, right? The, the available probabilistic resources um, at one's disposal. And because when you're calculating the improbability of an event, that must always be relative to the probabilistic resources at one's disposal. So for example, a, an analogy I sometimes give is imagine an ATM machine. We've all used ATM machines. And let's say that you've stolen someone's bank card, but you don't know the pin number and you put the bank card into the ATM machine. Well, there's, there's 10 digits on the 10 digit pin pad, right? there's zero to nine and there's a four digit pin number that you have to guess um and so that's equivalent to ten thousand there's ten thousand possible ways you could dial in a four digit number to a ten digit pin pad there it's ten to the fourth power um now most banks will lock you out of your account after three failed attempts at guessing the right pin number and so if you only have three attempts that corresponds to the probabilistic resources at one's disposal it's overwhelmingly more likely that you're going to fail to randomly guess the correct pin number if you're just punching in random numbers and so that's essentially analogous to what we're dealing with when it comes to the origins of life and the evolution of life on our planet is that that pro that universal probability band gets swamped very very quickly um the the chances of the self-replicatability of uh, an RNA molecule emerging in the primitive environment of the early Earth is, in my judgment, astronomically small. The, the, the getting these very specifically crafted proteins have to work together in concert to achieve these higher level objectives or getting um, a, an adult organism capable of reproduction from a zygote, a fertilized egg, is just way beyond what you can accomplish by chance and physical necessity. And the, the fossil record allows you sometimes to put a limit on how much time you have um, in terms of getting the A to B transitions that, that transpired in the history of life. Um, so for example, the um, human chimp divergence is thought to have taken place by most evolutionary biologists about 6 million years ago. Um, and um, there was a paper published uh, in 2008 in the Journal of Genetics by Rick Dura and Dina Schmidt from Cornell University, where they um, basically um, start to calculate using a population genetics model how what was what's the waiting time that you would require to get two-step uh non-adaptive mutations to um, in a transcription factor binding site how long would that take given what we know about the 
the population size, the, the, the effective population size of hominids, uh, which until very recently was in the 10,000 to 20,000 individuals per generation range, um, how, what we know about the generation turnover times and the average mutation rates. And they give an estimate of 216 million years for that two-step codependent mutation. Where, but guess what? You've only got 6 million years, according to the fossil record, for the entire transition. So that's known as the waiting time problem in evolutionary biology, which is also, I think, a formidable challenge. It's a numbers problem. Um, and so I think that's um, also relevant to the, the universal probability band. Uh, w one more follow-up question on that, because we do want to get to, uh, we, we want to, we said we're going to talk about the resurrection, but given your background there, I just wanted to touch on a couple of other issues. But you've mm -hmm. also interacted with Muslims um, in your discussions. And so given your, your background in biology, how are you not a Muslim, given the amazing scientific insights that you find uh, in the teachings of Muhammad and in the Quran? Yeah, and unfortunately, my own reading of the Quran uh, reveals the Quran to be rather a, a scientific train wreck rather than a, a scientific miracle. Wait, 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 wait. It's a scientific what? <laughs> it's a scientific train wreck. Train wreck. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Just want to make sure I heard not, that right. Not, not a scientific uh, miracle. I've actually debated Nadir Ahmed. <laughs> Our old friend Nadir Ahmed uh, on this very topic, which is um, fun to watch. But um, yeah, I, I just don't find what the Quran says about modern science to be at all plausible. You know, stars are apparently missiles that Allah hurls at demons who strain their ears in the direction of the heavenly councils and so on. I mean, I mean, just up and down the line, the Quran just gets it wrong about science as well as. A, many other things, such as the historical anachronisms that we find in the Quran and, and uh, the errors that the Quran makes in relation to Jesus and his crucifixion and so forth. So, I mean, the, the Quran is just a disaster zone as far as the evidence goes. But haven't scientists discovered that semen is formed between the backbone and ribs? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? Um, yeah, I'm afraid. Yeah. It's just one of the Quran's many, many blunders. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually it actually hasn't been pointed out enough. But uh, when, when the when when the Quran talks about the uh, the mingled fluids and so on, and then you go to the Hadith to figure out what this is talking about, that this is giving like the the two the two semens theory that was uh, that was common in the in the ancient world and would have been popular during the time of Muhammad and so on. And so it's, uh, it's, it's just there's still awesome stuff, awesome stuff too. To uh, point out there, right. uh, but, Muhammad okay. also seems to have been influenced by Muhammad also seems to have been influenced by Galen, especially his stuff on embryology, which is also a mess, I think. But uh, but it, but it was it was you know, standard for the time period in which he was writing. Yeah, it it looks like um, if you take some of the teachings of of Galen and and still of of Aristotle and Hippocrates that were circulating during the time, and you combine that with some of the common Jewish theories there that were that were uh, uh, eventually recorded in like the Talmud, and you sort of put that all together. That's the science that you get from the Muslim sources, which which now you have this double problem in the sense that uh, one, the Quran and Muhammad are getting things massively wrong, but two, they're also being plagiarized, and so it's this it's it's a double error. So interesting stuff. All right, so uh, that's a, a little bit on a little bit on science. Now, I asked you what you'd like to talk about, and you mentioned the uh, maximal data uh, approach to the resurrection, which would be contrasted, which would be uh, in contrast to the minimal facts approach, which is used by Gary Habermas and. Um, Mike Lacona, to an extent, uh, William Lane Craig, they all will put together sort of a short list of facts, um, you know, four facts or six facts, or I think uh, Habermas originally had 10 when he put it out, and then he added two more, and it was 12. And the general idea is here's, here, are a fact, here are facts that we have good evidence for and that the, the overwhelming majority of scholars in these fields, you know, New Testament studies or historical Jesus studies, these facts are granted by uh, people from very diverse back scholarly backgrounds, and they all grant these facts. And therefore, um, whatever theory you're putting forward to explain what happened with Jesus that got Christianity off the ground, it at least needs to fit these facts. And if you don't 
fit these facts, then you've got a problem right right from the beginning. So there are vari- there are variations, but that's the that's the general idea behind uh, some of these uh, minimal facts approaches. But you have a you have a different approach. So uh, one, anything you'd like to say about the minimal facts approach, uh, feel free to you know criticize it, um, and then and then talk about the approach you're using. Sure. So I've long been rather critical of the minimal facts approach, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is, so as you rightly said, the criteria that Gary Habermas uses to adduce his minimal facts would be, number one, it has to, in Habermas's judgment, be well-supported evidentially, and number two, it has to enjoy uh, scholarly support from more than 90% of scholars across the uh, spectrum. Now, when the first problem, that, as I see it, is when Habermas is so Haber, one of Habermas's criteria is the appearances, right? The the appearances um, is widely accepted by more than ninety percent of contemporary scholars, um, which is to say, not necessarily that Jesus in fact re- um, um, appeared to his disciples, rather the apostles had experiences which they interpreted as manifestations of the risen Christ. Um, And that is true. That is a minimal fact by Habermas's criteria. But when Habermas is pushed on alternative hypotheses, such as the the hypothesis of mass hallucination or um, some sort of, um, or or some sort of um, um, objective vision, then Habermas's response, rejoinder to that particular concern is to point out the implausibility of shared hallucinatory experiences. However, that takes him outside of his minimal fact criteria because that's no longer a minimal fact. Uh, the, the group experiences is not accepted by more than 90% of critical scholars. And nor for that matter is the multi-sensory nature of the resurrection encounters. And so Habermas has to switch his criteria midway through the argument. And so it feels to me a little bit like a bait and switch. Um, Another problem is that Habermas um, likes to um, utilize 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, which I think does have evidential value, but I would be very hesitant to repose too much confidence on that oral creedal tradition alone. I think that the consensus of scholarship is probably correct, that 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7 is a normal creedal tradition that predates Paul's own writing of 1 Corinthians in 53 AD or thereabouts. But um, I think that it's, it's no more than intelligent conjecture as to when and where Paul received that creed. So Habermas will say that, um, that Paul received that creed uh, perhaps in Jerusalem three years following his conversion when he meets with uh, Kephas and James, according to Galatians, uh, the very people mentioned in that creed. Um, but I mean, that, that's plausible, but I don't think that it's as securely established as Habermas would like. Um, it's also very difficult to, to adjudicate the rationality of the apostles' beliefs unless we can say something about what the experiences were like. Um, so 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7 is consistent with alternative scenarios, such as a non-speaking Jesus or a Jesus who appears only briefly. Um, and speaks with only a few words and then disappears, or um, or just very brief sightings at a distance or something like that, um, which don't necessarily bode well for the rationality of the apostles' beliefs that it was really, in fact, Jesus risen from the dead. So uh, the alternative approach that I prefer is, as you said, the maximal data approach. And this term was coined by my colleague and friend, Dr. Lydia McGrew. And uh, basically the maximal data approach Um, asserts up front uh, and argues for the hypothesis that the Gospels and Acts are substantially even strongly reliable, being written by individuals who are well-informed, close up to the facts, and habitually scrupulous. And that being the case, then one can reason that the claims in the Gospels and Acts concerning the nature and variety of the resurrection encounters with the risen Jesus actually are reflective of what 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 was being claimed and asserted by those who are purportedly eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection, including its multi-sensory nature involving multiple sensory modes, not just individual sightings, but group sightings, group conversations with Jesus, long discourses with Jesus, physical contact with Jesus, observing Jesus eating broiled fish in Luke 24, having breakfast with Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee in John 21. According to Acts 1, it was extended across a 40-day time period, so it's not just a brief and confusing episode, and so forth. And that's the sort of set of testimonial claims about which it's very difficult to be honestly mistaken about. So when, when anyone makes any sort of claim, whether that be you know, a sexual assault allegation or witness to a miracle, whatever it happens to be, there are 
three and only three broad categories of explanation that could explain why they made the claim. One is that they lied. One is that they're honestly mistaken. And one is that they're actually correct in their claim. And when we look at the nature and variety of the resurrection encounters in the Gospels, we find that it's very difficult to conceive of them being honestly mistaken. Another line of evidence, by the way, against them being honestly mistaken is in um, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul mentions that um, Christ is the first fruits from among the dead. And what he means by that is that Christ is the fulfillment of the first fruits feast, just as the first fruits in Leviticus 23 was the guarantor of the coming, the, the remainder of the harvest being delivered. So likewise, Christ is the first to be raised to glory and immortality ahead of the general resurrection at the end of the world. And and according to Leviticus 23, the day on which the first fruits feast is to be commemorated is the day following the first Sabbath, following the Passover, which would make it the Sunday. And so it's quite striking then that Jesus, in fact, does rise from the dead on the day that coincides with the feast of first fruits. That that points to design rather than just being happy coincidence. Either design on the part of the us of the Gospels, um, according to all four of which Jesus rose on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, the Sunday, or it arises by design on the part of God himself. Um, and so again, pointing away from the hypothesis of being honest and mistaken. And, and then we've, we've now redistributed the probabilities between two remaining contending hypotheses, namely Jesus in fact rose from the dead, or alternatively, that, um, that, the, that they lied about it. And when one studies the context of the apostolic claim, uh, we find that the apostles were voluntarily willing to undergo and endure sufferings and labors and dangers and hardships and persecutions and toils, and in some cases martyrdom on account of their testimony of uh, Christ risen from the dead. And so that um, goes a long way towards establishing their sincerity in making the claim that Jesus had risen from the dead. Uh, and then you've also got other evidence as, as well that also corroborate that, such as the utilization across all four gospels of women witnesses as the chief discoverers of the empty tombs and so forth, rising if they are making stuff up deliberately um, by virtue of the fact that in first century Israel, which was a patriarchal society, the testimony of a woman was worth a fraction of that of a male witness and so forth. And so by reducing very, very dramatically the plausibility of those two contending alternative hypotheses or categories of explanation for the resurrection claim, namely that they were honestly mistaken or that they lied, you in turn redistribute the probabilities to render the hypothesis that God in fact raised Jesus from the dead as the most probable explanation of the pertinent evidence. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Uh, let, let me uh, let me give an actual example. So the, first, you're, you're pointing out that... Um, if someone is making a claim about something that happened, uh, it's possible that the person is lying. It's possible that the person is mistaken, uh, not not deliberately lying, but is just mistaken, believes it, um, but is uh, is wrong. And then there's the the idea that the person is telling the truth. But there's there's actually a, a quick example here from over in the uh, over in the chat. So forgiveness with Allah is trying to argue that is over in the chat trying to argue that. Rebecca was three, so um, his God and his prophet affirmed the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Torah, um, including the book of Genesis, and yet forgiveness with Allah is trying to convince everyone that it's okay to marry and have sex with a three-year-old girl um, as an indirect way of defending Muhammad's relationship with a nine-year-old girl. Um, and he wants everyone to believe in his religion so that we can all, I guess, marry three-year-old girls or something like that. But uh, he, he lays out his points here. He lays out his points defending it, expecting no one to actually look up any of these points. But I've seen these a million times before, and I've made videos on these. But look at what he says here. Um, because here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible never mentions the age of Rebecca. It only mentions... It only... Uh, it only... Uh, says that she's a young woman. It repeatedly calls her a young woman. And so you need to basically tie together different dates in the Bible to try and get something, to try and get an age for him. And when you look at the, the Muslim uh, attempts to do this, they always include a lie. Always. There's always some bridge, and they hope no one will look at it. So look at what we have here. Point three. This is what supposedly ties everything together. The incident on Mount Moriah, Genesis 22, and the birth of Rebekah happened at the same time. Really? Really? When Isaac was 36 or 37 years old, same time when Sarah died, and he gives Genesis 23, 1 through 3. Now, uh, matter of fact, 
just to be quick, because this, this does actually illustrate your point. Let's read Genesis 23, 1 through 3. So look, ladies and gentlemen, we're looking for a defense of the claim that the birth of Rebecca happened at the same time as the incident on Mount Moriah. You need that in order to uh, get the dates here. Here's the, here's the source. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his, uh, from before his dead and said to the Hittites, and then it goes on uh, into verse 4. So, ladies and gentlemen, two possibilities, I mean, three possibilities here, as Jonathan was pointing out. So, one, forgiveness with Allah is lying to us. Two, he's trying to tell the truth, but he, he's just getting it wrong. Or three, he's correct, and he's not. He's, so, so we can throw out the third option because he's not correct. So what are the options here? Uh, he's either lying or he's trying to tell the truth, but he's doing a bad job of it, and he's getting things wrong anyway. He's honestly mistaken. I'm actually going with honestly mistaken because all he's doing is cutting, a, cutting and pasting an article from some horrible Muslim website. So what's actually going on here is eventually someone had to lie, right? But at some point, someone had to lie. But then everyone copies the same lie and they pass on the lie, even though they think, oh, this is, this is a great website. I don't need to examine anything on this website because anything on this website is good as gold. So I'll just cut and paste it and, and share it. And who cares, if I'm, who cares if I'm wrong? And so it, the person's goal is not to deceive, and even though you could criticize them for trying to promote pedophilia in the middle of a live stream. Um, but look at what's going on here. So here you don't have to think that forgiveness with Allah is deliberately being deceptive, but he's getting things wrong. And you know that he's getting things wrong because you do a quick investigation. And then so then the options are either he's lying or he's honestly mistaken. Um, so just wanted to point that out. And, and the point here is, ladies and gentlemen, whenever you're, going, whenever you're uh, dealing with people who are copying stuff, you would definitely want to investigate it. Always look up the sources because believe it or not, you have some people who are liars and you have people who pass on the lies in order to uh, promote <laughs> pedophilia. It's so weird to think that there are still people in the world today uh, who, ah, I have to show that it's okay to have sex with little girls. Very, very strange stuff. Uh, now, that was all just one massive illustration of a of a the point that you're kind of starting with the three options that we need to consider. Um, on the, it seems like the the big difference between the minimal facts approach and the maximal data approach would be that the minimal facts guys are trying to avoid reliance. They're trying to skip the step of de of defending the reliability of the gospels and acts. And it's a, uh, it's sort of like your, your method entails a two-step system where first I defend these sources to show that these sources are accurate. And then what can we conclude based on those sources? Whereas they're trying to skip that step and say, okay, if we skip the reliability of those sources, except for specific instances where we defend a specific claim, um, we can just skip that and say, okay, here's what scholars agree to and what we have good evidence for. And let's build the case on that is, it, is that about right yeah unfortunately though i think for the minimal facts case um you you cannot really build a robust case unless you can have the group appearances um and preferably the multi-sensory character of the resurrection encounters but that's not a minimal fact for those criteria so um it I, I think that when the audience realizes just how little is actually granted by the consensus of scholarship i, I think the argument becomes a lot we a lot weaker at least it certainly rhetorically um as well as well as um, yeah so on uh, so on that on that point so for for everyone for whom you know this is like new stuff um i'm talking about general case for the resurrection type stuff S scholars almost across the board so atheist scholars liberal christian scholars agnostic scholars jewish scholars almost everyone will will grant at the scholarly level almost everyone grants that some of the disciples had some sort of experiences that they interpreted as appearances of the risen Jesus. Um, but like, you know, I had a, I had a live stream with, uh, with Bart Ehrman. I was asking him about that. And, and it seems like I could be getting this wrong, but it seems like he's granting an appearance to Peter an appearance to Mary Magdalene and one to Paul. And then maybe James, he's sort of, who knows, 
but then yeah once you get to where they're group hallucinations things are a bit more a bit more shaky there uh whereas the group appearances are pretty significant in terms of ruling out hallucinations because it's it's one thing for peter to see some sort of hallucination a grief hallucination or something like that it's something you're in a completely different world as far as a group of people all seeing a hallucination because then now you're kind of ruling out hallucinations by by the very idea so uh so what you're, you're it sounded like what you were saying is um the minimal facts guys they're they're treating the the appearances as a fact and saying ah but scholars you know across the board grant appearances but if you look at the specifics of what the scholars grant they're not actually granting the group appearances which you kind of need to rule out the, right. the hallucinations exactly Exactly. And also another feature of Habermas's work, which I have problems with, is that he doesn't carefully distinguish between a scholar that might give a wholehearted endorsement of a particular fact versus one that says, yeah, it's slightly more likely than not or somewhat plausible. And without making those distinctions, I think that that also has the potential, unfortunately, to, to mislead. If, um, yeah, so I, I, that's also a vulnerability, I think, of Habermas's work. Um, now, what would you think? And we can we can obviously go into uh, more detail about about your approach here here in a second. But um, what would you think about like a uh, sort of combination approach? Like, say, if we just go with some of the historical facts uh, that are granted across the board, even if we if we narrow them down to things that we can actually that, that everyone actually agrees on, um, and then saying here's the case that you could build with that, but here if you bring in more data by defending these sources then you have these additional facts that go on and here's what you could conclude what would you what would you think about that because yeah so don't get me wrong i'm not saying that um habermas's approach is of no evidential value i think that you can use some some evidence from first Corinthians 15 3 through 7. Uh, i think that the individual ex encounters the individual experiences do uh, contribute evidential value i just am not convinced that it would be sufficient to convince me of the resurrection if i was limiting the scope of my analysis to the minimal facts case um and so that's why i appeal to a, a broader data set um, and i think that you know we as, as Christians, we should consider it a privilege, not a burden, to defend the reliability of the Gospels and Acts, because the evidence for the robust reliability of the Gospels and Acts and the grounding in credible eyewitness testimony is absolutely spectacular. And so it's a privilege, not a burden, to defend that. What would you, uh, um, what would, what dates would you give for the Gospels and Acts? Because uh, it's pretty common to see, uh, to see, well, it's pretty common to see this. In Mark, you have Jesus predicting the fall of Jerusalem. That's around 70. Mark's the beginning, and so around 70 for Mark, and then everything after that, at some point after that. So uh, after that for Luke, because Luke draws on Mark, and then uh, Acts is part two of Luke Acts, so Acts after that. So uh, what what dates would you put on, on the uh, Gospels and Acts? Good question. So I'm non-committal on dates. Uh, I think that there's a lot of conjecture that goes into assigning dates to the Gospels. I, I'm not a fan of that argument that you just um, elaborated, uh, because uh, I, I, I it, of course, I, I believe that I believe in the potential of Jesus to make supernatural predictions about the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. So that doesn't necessarily commit me to saying that Mark has to be written. 70 or, or just slightly post 70 or, or what have you um and there there's some internal evidences in the gospels that might suggest that they're quite a bit earlier than that um, so for instance um an argument that's not conclusive on its own but it does have some evidential value is the fact that as has often been pointed out that acts ends on kind of a cliffhanger with paul being mm -hmm. placed under house arrest and um it doesn't you know give you uh, an account of paul's death it doesn't mention the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem doesn't mention the great fire that broke out in Rome in AD 64 and the ensuing persecution of the Christians and so forth. Uh, and particularly, it doesn't mention um, Paul's demise. Um, and um, it doesn't, it, Paul seems to have had another Roman imprisonment if you read the pastoral letters, it doesn't mention that. So that suggests, I don't think it's completely conclusive, but it suggests that Acts was written prior to those events, um, perhaps in the early 60s, 
AD, um, I say it's not conclusive because it's an argument from silence, um, though perhaps a better argument from silence than many other arguments from silence, but nonetheless an argument from silence. So I don't think it's completely conclusive. But um, if Acts is dated around then, then Luke has to be earlier still. Um, and Mark and Matthew are usually thought to be earlier than Luke. And so that would push them even further back. There is also a quotation of Luke's gospel in 1 Timothy 5.18, where it says, for the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox what's treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. And it's quoting from, I think it's Luke 10, I think it's verse 7, um, where, um, where, where, where it's quoting Jesus from the gospel of Luke, and it refers to it as scripture. And I actually think that the pastoral letters are genuinely Pauline. I have a, a, an extent, a very detailed essay on my website where I defend the Pauline authorship of the pastoral letters. That being the case, then Luke has to predate if that if he is really referring to Luke as opposed to some earlier source that Luke is drawing on, uh, which I think is quite plausible. Then Luke has to predate um, the writing of of uh, the pastoral letters, which would place Luke fairly early, um, perhaps even as early as the, as the 50s, and then Matthew Mark would be uh, earlier still. So as I said, I'm non-committal on dates, but I think that they certainly have to be written. Er I, they have to be written early enough in order to be anchored in substantially reliable and credible eyewitness testimony because that's what the evidence really points to all right so uh everyone it, when you're seeing dates for the for the gospels and acts everyone um it, it's important to keep the, the the methodologies in mind as far as the just the the the, the bare overarching methodology one approach if you're not granting um if you're not granting Jesus the ability to predict the future. So if you're, if you have especially a naturalistic framework in mind, then you'd say, okay, in the gospel of Mark, Jesus predicts the fall of Jerusalem. That didn't happen till 70. So that's must've been around the time when it was written or, or after that. Uh, and then the other gospels use Mark as a source. And so they must be later. Notice there are assumptions built into that methodology and they're not completely correct. Even if you wanted to say Jesus can't predict the future, you don't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't actually have to have supernatural knowledge. Jesus could just look at the way things are going and say, wait a minute, you guys keep rebelling against the Romans. The Romans are going to come and crush you and they're going to rip all your stuff down because that's what the Romans do. So uh, you wouldn't even have to have supernatural um, knowledge. So that's not even a that's not a, a terribly great uh, assumption to build all your your dating on, uh, but look if you if you didn't have that assumption if you didn't have that assumption and you just looked at when when does it look like these things were written? Uh, well, what what Jonathan was pointing out, Acts looks the book of Acts looks like it's written in the early '60s, and the reason the reason Jonathan gave is that's sort of where it ends. It sort of fizzles out. And then, but all this stuff happened right after that. It's like, why is not that stuff put in there? Like you've got the martyrdom of Paul. You'd have the martyrdom of Peter. You've got all this stuff that he cooked, the fall of Jerusalem. You've got all this stuff that happens right after uh, Acts ends and it's not in there. And so this would be like me writing, let's say I wrote a book. Uh, I write a biography of Michael Jackson and I end it when he comes out with Thriller. I mean, it would seem odd to end there, unless you're just trying to get to where he he releases Thriller, something like that. But the question is, why don't, you've got all this stuff that happens after that, and then ultimately his death and so on. Why aren't you including that? But notice, you could, you could have some sort of explanation for ending it Thriller. Like maybe you just want to build up to that great moment or something like that. But imagine it just ends on some completely, you know, relatively insignificant point in Michael Jackson's life. And that's where your book ends. It's like, why did you end there? Especially if there's all this awesome stuff that happened later. And so applying that methodology, you've got Luke looks like Acts is written in the early sixties. And then, so you sort of reverse the process. You say, okay, so at, so Acts came after Luke. So Luke is before that and Luke incorporated Mark as a source. And so now you're dealing with Mark like in the fifties or something like that. And uh, so anyway, the point there is a lot of assumptions going into this. Uh, Jonathan has pointed that his methodology doesn't rely on specific dates. They just need to be early enough to where they're giving um, accurate information. So uh, where where would you where would you like to? We got about fifteen minutes left. Uh, where would you like to go in terms of you could you could give more uh, because uh, you seem to have a two step process. Defend the sources then. Uh, what comes what you can draw and gather from those sources and build your case there. Uh, do you want to talk more about? Uh, details that you can know, given the the reliability of the sources, or more on the reliability of the sources. 
Uh, let's give a few examples uh, of evidences that we can induce to corroborate these, the grounding of the Gospels and Acts in reliable eyewitness testimony. So let me give you just uh, a couple of examples from the Gospels and a couple from Acts. Um, so, if, so to take a couple of Gospel examples, um, it, uh, only mur- resurrection of Jesus is that, that's found in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000 miracle. And if we go over to John chapter 6, we have John's account of the feeding of the 5,000 miracle. And in verse 5, it says, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to baptize so these people may eat? And that raises a question immediately in the mind of the attentive reader. Why does Jesus turn to Philip here in particular? Why um, not say Judas Iscariot, who's in charge of the money bag or something like that? Well, if we go over to, um, to chapter 12 of John's account, this is in um, an unrelated um, section of John's gospel, six chapters later, a different Passover feast. And it mentions in verse 20 that there were some Greeks at the feast of Passover who wanted to talk to Jesus. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And so add some parenthesis here that he, Philip was from the town of Bethsaida, very casually brought in to the account. Um, now, if we go over to Luke's account, which is the parallel of the feeding of the 5,000 miracle um, in Luke chapter 9, we learn that the event of the feeding of the 5,000 actually um, takes place in uh, Bethsaida. That's in verse 10. On the return, of the apostles told them all they had done and taught, uh, all they had done, and he took them on the drew part to a town called Bethsaida, and that's where the feeding of the 5,000 takes place. And so by extracting information from John's account in John 6, from John 12, and from Luke 9, we can build a, a complete explanation for why Jesus might speak to Philip in John 6, 5, because he's a local guy. He knows where the shops are to buy bread. But that's not something that's spelled out explicitly for the reader. One has to do the detective work of putting those puzzle pieces together, and that sort of casual interlocking, or this artless dovetailing, this undesigned coincidence, is rather surprising on the work of historical fiction, but is not hugely surprising if this is genuine historical reportage. Now, there's also an account of this miracle in Mark chapter 6. So Mark um, tells us in Mark chapter 6 and verse 31, he said to them, come away by ourselves to a desolate place and rest a while, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Um, And so it gives you a picture of the hustle and bustle of the place. It's very busy. They can't find leisure to eat their lunch. And so Jesus has them come away to a deserted area to eat. But unfortunately for them, the crowds follow. And it it says in verse 39 that Jesus commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Now, in Israel, the grass is actually not green, but it's brown throughout the majority of the year, except at a a relatively narrow window of time during the spring because of the higher levels of rainfall that coincides with the Feast of Passover. Now, when we go over to John's account, John does not mention the people coming and going, indicating how busy it is. He also doesn't mention the green grass, but he does mention in verse 4 a detail that's not found in Mark, namely that the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was at hand, which then illuminates and corroborates uh, Mark's gospel. So that's um, just one, that's two examples of one species of evidence that corroborates the the um, grounding of the Gospels in testimony of individuals who are close up to the facts and well informed. Um, another, uh, so an, an example um, from the Book of Acts. Uh, so oh, the one, Book of one, Acts. One, one, one second, uh, one second. So yeah. this is this is going to be a different example, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure everyone's sort of understanding it here and make sure make sure I understand it. So the idea behind the undesigned coincidences would be. So you have some detail described in, let's say, the book of John, and there's some detail there, and it seems like an insignificant detail. It's not, it's not, a, it's like, okay, I have no idea why that little detail is there. It doesn't, it doesn't add a lot to the story. Um, and then you'll have like a different gospel and you'll have a different detail added that, that seems like, you know, not a lot of weight uh, placed on that little detail, but you start combining these and they start explaining each other and so you have things like that but then if you have a bunch of them it's sort of like they're forming a kind of like interconnected web of confirmation where there, there's all these little spots where they're confirming and explaining each other and uh, you were you were talking about this in terms of confirming that this goes back to people who knew what they were talking about their stories are actually they have all of this internal confirmation where they're where they're they're confirming each other um but it it i i'm assuming there there would be the added argument that this is god putting this piecing this thing together 
Um, is, is that is is that part of the like case for divine inspiration? Like that's so no. interconnected in there, or is this just in terms of like historical reliability? No, this is just in terms of historical reliability. I don't believe that God dictates scripture, right? I'm not a dictation theorist when it comes to inspiration. I do think most uh, informed Christians would be dictation theorists. But um, but this certainly points to uh, the historical trust for the, these sources. And it, I, I emphasize that it is a cumulative case. So I'm not resting the argument on two examples. I'm just giving you two examples to whet your appetite and give you a flavor of this species of evidence. And there's dozens upon dozens of these that crisscross the documents. And that's just one species of evidence. There's also other types of evidence, such as extra biblical corroborations of incidental details in the Gospels. You've got what I call the similarities between between the gods, which are the uh, unity of, of people's characters. Uh, there is um, uh, various other lines of evidence that one could adduce. Um, uh, unexplained allusions would be another. Now, let me go over to the book of Acts to give a couple of examples of undesigned coincidences there, uh, which indicates, I think, that the author of Acts was indeed someone who was well acquainted with Paul's travels. And I would argue is um, this evidence is best explained by, by Luke actually being someone, she was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. So if we go over to 1 Corinthians 4, and uh, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians from Ephesus. We know that because he sends greetings from Aquila and Priscilla at the end of the letter, and we know from Acts, uh, they traveled with him. He met them in Corinth, and they traveled with him as far as Ephesus. Uh, and he also makes an allusion to remaining in Ephesus in, in 1 Corinthians. So he's, he's writing from Ephesus in Asia Minor, and he's writing to the Corinthian church, which is across the uh, Aegean Sea from Corinth and uh, from Ephesus. And Corinth is the capital of Achaia, what we now know as Greece. And he says in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17, that's why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. And so at the time of his writing to the uh, Corinthian Christians from Ephesus, he's already dispatched Timothy. He sent Timothy on his way from Ephesus to Corinth. And um, then when you get to chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, we learn in verse 10, it says, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. And so even though he's already sent Timothy, we now understand that he nonetheless expects his letter to arrive in Corinth before Timothy arrives. How does that work? Well, we'd infer that Timothy must have taken an indirect route to Corinth, and the letter presumably went a more direct route. Now, the most direct way to send a letter um, from Ephesus to Corinth would be over the Aegean Sea from Ephesus to Corinth um, and by boat. We'd infer then that Timothy must have taken the indirect overland route going up through Troas and Macedonia on his way around from Ephesus to Corinth. Now, when you turn over to the book of Acts in Acts chapter 19, which is uh, which concerns uh, when Paul is in Ephesus, we read in Acts chapter 19, verse 21 to 22, it says, now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, that's where Corinth is, by the way, and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So Paul remains behind in Ephesus, and he sends Timothy up through Macedonia, exactly as you would expect, given those clues in 1 Corinthians. Uh, but it doesn't even mention that Corinth is the destination of Timothy, but it fits in an artless and casual and undesigned way. Notice also that Timothy's traveling companion on this expedition is Erastus. Now, Erastus, we learned from Romans 16, was actually the city treasurer of Corinth. 2 Timothy 4 also mentions Erastus remaining at Corinth. And so um, Corinth is Erastus's hometown. So it's quite fitting then that Timothy should be traveling with Erastus. Erastus actually we have archaeological evidence for because there was a pavement slab recovered from the ruins of ancient Corinth that mentions that Erastus um, laid down this pavement at his own expense, right? He paid the expense of this pavement. Um, and so uh, there, there's, this is an incredible example. And just there's, there's actually um, just taking you know, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Galatians, never mind the other letters in the New Testament. I can already adduce more than 40 examples of that sort of undesigned coincidence between the Book of Acts and the letters of Paul. So um, I think that undesigned coincidences is a very powerful way to argue internally for the robust reliability of the Gospels and Acts. So um, for, for uh, I just know from experience, there's a, there are, lo there are lots of different levels of um, background in this information with, with people in the, ch some people will be familiar with the approach. Uh, some people that for some people, this will be completely new information. So the, the general idea here is if uh, let's say me and some people I know 
uh, we're all describing the events of the past 20 years, but we're focusing on different things. And I might be focusing on this and they might be focusing on that. Um, but we, we, let's say we generally know each other and some of those things uh, overlapped, some of our, some of our encounters uh, overlapped with each other. And then years later, we all write accounts of what happened. You could actually compare our accounts and find all these things where, where, where things are matching up, where I'm explaining something in more detail that this other person um, only mentioned. And these undesigned coincidences where I just mentioned some seemingly insignificant detail and someone else does, but then they sort of tie into each other and, and help explain what the other person is saying and so on. So you have, if you have this situation, you have, let's say, you know, my story and some other person's story and some other person's story, and you can tie them together. The more of these things you have, the more it looks like we're actual people who are talking about events that we witnessed or that we have very good evidence of. Whereas the alternative is, if it's me making up a bunch of stuff and another guy making up a bunch of stuff and another guy making up a bunch of stuff, it seems extraordinarily, insanely unlikely that they're going to be in this situation of constantly confirming each other when you when you start comparing them. Is that, is that about that the general idea? Exactly. That was an excellent summary. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So and you you mentioned that. So you mentioned a couple of examples, but you're saying there are lots of these. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned uh, in the description, I have a I have a couple links here. Um, where would people find uh, more information on those? So you ha you have your website here, uh, JonathanMcClatchy.com. Is that a good place to go? Yeah, JonathanMcClatchy.com is my own blog. I also recommend uh, a couple of good YouTube channels which cover this in some detail. So my own, of course, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy. I touch on this in some of my interviews and talks and debates I've done. Also, I recommend Lydia McGrew's YouTube channel. And I also recommend Testify, which is Eric Manning's YouTube channel, which is also an excellent place to go on all things New Testament reliability. And then in terms of literature, I recommend Lydia McGrew's book, Hidden in Plain View, Undesigned Coincidences in the Gospels and Acts. I also recommend her other two books, which are um, The Mirror of the Mask, Liberating the Gospels from Literary Devices, as well as uh, her third book, which is The Eye of the Beholder, The Gospel of John's Historical Reportage. Um, William Paley is also a good place to go, especially for examples in the Book of Acts. He wrote a, an excellent work called Hare Paulini, which means, translated from the Latin title, it means uh, the times of Paul. Um, and uh, of course, William Paley's book, um, A View of the Evidence of Christianity, is also excellent. So there's a few good resources for you all to check out. Now, your article here, uh, I have a link to your article, article on Dr. McClatchy's uh, case for the resurrection. So um, what, what will people find there? Like what, so that's what, what level is that on like level 10 being scholarly and level one being like total beginner? Uh, what level would you put that at? Perhaps seven. Um, okay. So it's uh, basically it's the evidential value of Luke Acts to the case for the resurrection. So it shows how you can limit the scope of your analysis just to Luke and Acts and how far you can go in making the case for the resurrection. And I argue that you can actually go quite far in developing that case. And uh, one more thing that, that I definitely wanted to get to before we uh, before we sign off here, uh, you have a ministry. I have the link here in the description box. Talk about doubts.com. So tell us about that. Yeah, so talkaboutdoubts.com is a ministry that I launched in December of this past year, at last year in 2021. Um, it's a, basically a spinoff of something I'd been doing on my own personal website since 2016, which was mentoring Christians who have doubts concerning the veracity of the Christian faith, of the gospel. And so basically, um, since 2016, on my personal website, I've had a form that people could fill out. And uh, then I would set up a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call to talk with them about their doubts. Um, and that was, it's always it's been a long-standing passion of mine. And I, I am, I've long been fascinated about why people leave Christianity. And, and I love to talk to people that wrestle with, with doubts about their faith. And so more recently, in 2021, I decided to launch this new ministry called talkaboutdoubts.com, where I would bring together and assemble a, a, a team of scholars and experts and thinkers who are willing to do private Zoom calls with Christians who are wrestling with intellectual doubts, as well as ex-Christians who want to explore whether there might be an, a rationally honest way back to faith. And uh, so uh, we have currently over 50 scholars on our team. Um, some of these scholars will be 
well known to your audience, I'm sure. We've got people like uh, Dr. Timothy McGrew, who's a professor of philosophy at Western Michigan University. Uh, we have people like uh, Doc, Dr. Max Speaker Heitch, who's a philosopher at uh, University of Oxford, excellent thinker. Um, we have um, Dr. Stephen Myers, uh, um, the Cambridge trained philosopher of science. We've got um, um, uh, just science. we've got Dr. Titus Kennedy from Biola University, um, who's an arche biblical archaeologist and specializes in, especially in the Old Testament. But he's also written a book now on the New Testament archaeology. So um, we've got archaeologists, New Testament scholars, uh, Hebrew scholars. Like we've got C. John Collins, for example. We've got um, Old Testament scholars, New Testament scholars. Uh, we've got um, philosophers. Um, biochemists, we've got um, psychologists and therapists and pastors uh, that are able to help out in particular on people's emotional um, doubts as well. Um, and we also have now just launched a, a new um, branch of this ministry, which is a Discord community for people who are our former inquirers of talkaboutdoubts.com, which helps us to stay in touch and uh, continue to mentor and disciple Christians who are struggling with doubts. And we also uh, host weekly hangouts on Zoom, which are on Tuesdays at 9 p.m. for people who are um, 9, 9 p.m. Eastern for people who are um, former inquirers of talkaboutdoubts.com. And we um, are planning to launch a series of weekend retreats as well for Christians who are struggling with doubts concerning the veracity of the Christian faith. So that's a little bit about talkaboutdoubts.com. So the uh, so uh, uh, again, uh, it, because there's kind of a big problem here that I see over and over and over again when uh, when I'm uh, when I hear from or when I talk to someone who. Uh, you know, grew up as a Christian and then eventually left Christianity in college or something. I see this repeating story over and over again. Uh, you know, then I asked my mom about this issue and my mom couldn't answer me. So I just, I realized that Christianity doesn't have answers for this, right? Um, I see that or, or uh, I asked my pastor and he couldn't explain this to me. So I realized that this isn't true. And normally I'm thinking, well, if your mom can't answer this, it's possible that it's because there's no there's no explanation for this. But why in the name of common sense would you think if your mom can't answer something that uh, that there's no answer for? It? So so what you're saying is you're you guys are um, you're, you're filling this need by saying, OK, we've got experts in various fields. And so someone would go to the website, someone who's struggling with doubts and saying, you know, I, I really saw this, this, I was watching this Richard Dawkins video and he said this, and it really makes sense. And so I'm, I'm doubting my Christianity. You're saying they would go to your website. They would fill out something that basically explains what their doubts are and that you would match up with a person who would be, uh, would be, um, well-informed in that field to talk to the person about the issues that are bothering them. Exactly. So basically the way it works is that someone goes to the website, talkaboutdoubts.com, and submits a form uh, which we distribute to the scholar that would be most appropriate to addressing that question. And different scholars on our team have different frequencies with which they're willing to take questions. So some people take questions once a week, other people once a month or once every six weeks or what have you. Um, and so we distribute that to one of our scholars, and then that scholar will get in contact with that individual directly and schedule a Zoom call. And that could be a one-on-one -on -one call or sometimes a two-on-one call. Um, and, uh, and then we often do follow-up. It's not uncommon for us to do multiple calls with people and to continue uh, the, the, the relationship and to um, help them to work to not only address their doubts, but also to uh, develop protocols for working through doubts in an intellectually responsible an honest way. Uh, so we help people, for instance, to distinguish between you know, a question versus an objection. Not all questions are objections, but a question can be made an objection by adding additional premise, either that we do know the answer and it entails some sort of internal inconsistency or is at odds with empirical evidence, or we, we don't know the answer and that entails, that, and, and if Christianity were true, we should expect to know the answer. Um, short of that additional premise, the question is only a question. They also, we, all, we also help people to distinguish between you know, low stake versus high stake objections. Um, you know, an objection to, for instance, um, a lot of people who are deconverts grew up in a very hyper conservative, rigid, um, fundamentalist background. Um, taking uh, and basically equated Christianity with adherence to the idea of the earth is 6,000 years old. Um, and I would consider that more of a low stakes objection because there are alternative, you know, hermeneutical frameworks for understanding the early chapters of Genesis, which are quite consistent with an old earth paradigm or perspective. So one could very well, I, I would argue it's more rational to revise one's theology in, in cases like that, uh, rather than 
ditch Christianity in toto. Um, so yeah, we, we try to help people to think through um, these sorts of issues. How do we think about evidence? How do we make sense of the fact that um, Christianity, like most complex topics, it has evidence both for and against. The evidence can sometimes be, be messy and to encourage people to be content with less than absolute certainty, but having enough evidence to be tremendously confident in the truth of the gospel and to be able to be comfortable with there being facts and evidence on both sides of the question. But the trends of evidence tend to, in my judgment at least, confirm the veracity of Christianity over and above the, the falsehood thereof. All right, well, that sounds like a uh, very, very significant and much, much needed uh, ministry today. In fact, I might want to, uh, for people who don't, some people don't watch uh, long live streams and so on, but uh, uh, remind me if I forget, Jonathan, but I like to make a, a, a commercial for that, just a nice little commercial um, at some point, uh, pointing people to that ministry just so. Uh, well, it's important just not for people who have doubts, but it's important for, you know, parents and friends and so on to know where to go if, you know, someone comes up to them and says, hey, you know, this has really been bothering me. And if you're a parent or, you know, you're a friend of this person and you don't know how to answer, hey, why, why not Why not give them a link and, and tell them to, to fill out the form? Absolutely. We get a lot of requests from parents as well and uh, p parents whose kids have walked away. So even if you yourself are not struggling with debts, but you know someone who is, feel free to direct them to this resource. Or if you would just want to chat with us about how you can be a resource for your kids who've walked away from the faith, if you're a parent, then this resource is for you as well. We also talk to pastors who are doubting their faith and people in full-time ministry. We keep people's information completely confidential. So you're also more than welcome to reach out to us with your doubts and concerns and questions as well. All right. Well, thanks to uh, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy for joining us here and talking about some of uh, his background, his work um, in science and uh, on the resurrection and a little bit with Islam as well. And uh, his uh, awesome, sounds like an awesome ministry. Uh, again, links to those things are all in the description box. Be sure to check them out and uh, we'll catch you all next time.